And we're about to cross to, to London, where a, a very beautiful lady is, uh, is waiting for us over there to join us. You'll recognise her from the Foresight Saga, the Palaces, and a host of other acting roles. Please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Susan Hampshire. <laughs> Susan, welcome to the show. It's good Thank to talk you. to you. And how are things in London today? Well, it's a very nice day, it's very warm, and I had to wait outside in the street for half an hour for a taxi to get here, so I have to tell you, it's a nice day. Good on you. I hope you didn't mind waiting, because we certainly believe you're, you'd be wa worth waiting for. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Not okay, that... many people would say that. <laughs> well, that's the, that's the blarney out of the way, now down to the, uh, the nitty-gritty. <laughs> you know, you've had a remarkable career, Susan, and more remarkable because you suffer from dyslexia. Was that a, a disadvantage coming into an acting career? Well, I think it was sheer folly, really, because when I started acting, I had no idea that you had to read so many scripts and that you had to do so much research for parts. I just thought you stood up on the stage and did the first thing that came in you, to your head, which is pretty well what I did when I started, and I was really bad. But I have to tell you, in a funny kind of way, people who are dyslexics are born with a, an extra quota of determination, and I think hard work sometimes uh, counts for more than qualifications. So for me perhaps being dyslexic um, has been an advantage. The real disadvantage was in my early career when I used to go to hundreds and hundreds of auditions and never get a job because I couldn't read well enough for the part. Mm. But as time goes on I don't have to read anymore so it's not so bad. Uh, just thinking, we use the term dyslexic but it might be worthwhile just explaining to people who don't know exactly what dyslexia is. Yes, it's a specific spelling and reading difficulty and a lot of children who are of above average intelligence have this difficulty. They may be very good at maths and science, but with reading and spelling they have tremendous difficulty. It's a problem really to do with sequencing and it's obviously inher it's sometimes inherited from the mother or the father, it's sometimes from conditions at birth and it's sometimes what's called acquired dyslexia, which you get it through a shock. Uh, you might have a car accident and then afterwards you have all the symptoms of a dyslexic. How did you get yours, Susan? What? How did you get yours? Uh, mine is inherited from my mother. And uh, what is really rough is that in the schools at the moment, there just don't seem to be enough people that know about it. And uh, so therefore, a lot of children are being told that they're lazy or stupid or aren't working hard. When this isn't the case, they just have a problem only with this one area. And obviously, the more it's talked about, the better. And I, I don't talk about it from my own point of view. It's really because I feel very strongly that, that kids that are sitting at the back of the class of 30 and who are being gnawed and given a rough time and are losing their confidence so early, it's really criminal. And I think that life's tough enough anyway without having that disadvantage. So, sure, um, yeah. That's the reason I, why I I'm pleased that you'll, that you'll talk about it because there'd be, I don't want to spend the whole interview in just talking about dyslexia, but there'd be so many people watching our show today who'd be sufferers of it. And to see someone like yourself who's gone on to so much success and do so many wonderful things, it would be, uh, it'd be great for them because you'd be some sort of, of role model and I guess you'd, you'd have to find yourself in that sort of position. <clears throat> In fact, what I've done is I've just written a book called Every Letter Counts, and I've interviewed a hundred dyslexic, and a lot of them are really well-known people. I mean, people like Michael Heseltine in the Parliament, and Greg Luganis, and Schur, a lot of film stars, a lot of people big in business, who are all dyslexic, who've all told their story, and I think it's really nice that uh, other young dyslexics can have lots of people that they can say, oh my goodness, well, this Olympic champion is dyslexic and it hasn't stopped him getting on. So, in a way, I think that uh, the more people stand up and are counted, the better. Yeah, just one question. Uh, when you're doing a movie or a play and there's a last-minute change of script, it, it must be very soul-destroying for you because you'd have to take longer than the others. Uh, yes, because, for instance, if you were going to learn something and I was going to learn something, and it would take you 20 minutes, it would take me probably an hour and a half. But I have developed an extremely good memory. Um, and under pressure, um, the right kind of pressure, I can absorb something and retain it. But as I get older, <laughs> I'm finding it harder. So, I mean, this is the kind of thing I don't want to be handed a new script uh, at the last minute now. But in, when I was younger, I could take it. OK, your career, which I've mentioned already, is one that uh, you can be justly proud of. We've loved your work over here in Australia. But it always surprised me that you didn't decide to conquer Hollywood. Was that ever an ambition for you? 
Well, I did. I was taken out there when I was very young, I don't know, about 19 or something, with a lot of very big contracts under offer, which would have meant m big money, whether I made the movies or not. And the contracts were, say, for three years, five years, or seven years. But, you know, um, something inside me told me that I had to do it my own way. And I was sort of frightened that if I went there, I'd become a kind of high-class whore. <laughs> and I wouldn't, you know, because you felt that you had to be friendly with... I'm sure this isn't true, but you felt you had to be friendly with the head of the studio in order to get the roles. So ultimately, I turned everything down and came home and just did it my own way, which meant that I never earned the same money and I never became a particularly big star. And I didn't, in Hollywood terms, make it. But in a way, you have to think about your quality of life for yourself and what really means a lot to you. And if you are a happier individual, then you are going to be probably a better person on this earth than if you are miserable and perhaps a very big star. So I just did what was right for me, really. Susan, you're not suggesting for one moment, are you, that in Hollywood there could be such a thing as a casting couch? <laughs> Well, I'm not saying that there was, but when I was very young, I felt that. I felt this tremendous pressure of, you know, uh, when you're very young, even if you're not particularly attractive, you're nubile and people want to touch you and, you know, take you home to your, their pool and offer you this and say you can have that. And I felt very vulnerable there. I'm not in any way saying that these men in America were after my body, but... <laughs> <laughs> if oh, they weren't, they'd be crazy. <laughs> Uh, anyway, all I can say is that I did what I thought was best for me. Susan, what's been your, your finest moment professionally? Well, I suppose um, you have a lot of moments which I consider lucky in my career. Obviously, playing Fleur in the Foresight Saga was a very lucky moment. Funnily enough, I'm in a show at the moment called Little Night Music, and I'm singing for the first time in <coughs> 30 years. And uh, this has been a very lucky thing for me, because it's a fantastically good showy role. It's not very big, but it's very witty, very, very well written. It's not the lead. Dorothy Tutin plays the lead, and magnificently she sings Send in the Clowns. But I just have a rather small but brilliantly written part, and this has sort of been another lucky moment in my career. So they come and go, don't they? What's your biggest song in the show? Uh, uh, I do two songs. One is called Every Day a Little Death, which is a very uh, extraordinarily observation on marriage and... <laughs> how dodgy marriage is, and the other is A Weekend of the Country, which I do with other people. Yeah. You would like nice to sing a couple of bars nice for us, would you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you really want this after you've just had that expert singing a moment ago. I think I won't poison your ears. All I can no, say no. is a couple of days ago we had Catherine Grayson on the line from Hollywood and she sang a couple of bars. Now, I mean, you've got to uphold oh, the really... British tradition, haven't you? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Hear my audience. I don't know how much you know about Stephen Sondheim music, but it isn't, um, it isn't, uh, it's not like Oklahoma. So you might be expecting something that you can all go out whistling, and it isn't like that. It's just very witty lyrics. I'll do one line for you. Good on you. A weekend in the country, how amusing, how delightfully droll. A weekend in the, oh no, I'll give you a better bit than that. <laughs> Let me just, <laughs> um, she'll grow older by the hour. No, I'm not going to be able to do it without having thought about it first. I'm terribly sorry. Well, I'll tell you what <laughs> we can do. I've got a couch here, not a, not a casting couch, I've got a, a couch I here on my set. When yes. you come to Australia, I want you to be a special guest on the show, and by that time we will yes. have given you a lot of time to rehearse, yes. and you've got to go out, set a stage and sing a song for us. Is that a deal, Susan? That is a deal. Good on you. Okay, I'll do that. <laughs> I know you've gone through some trouble to be in our... Our London studios today. I, I do thank you for it. It's just an absolute delight to to have the opportunity of having you on the show. And I know people thank right you. around Australia would be delighted to uh, to see you. So thank you, Susan. Good luck in the future. And the next time, the next time, you sing for us, sing. okay? <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Susan Hampshire, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Bye-bye. Lovely lady, eh? Oh. Yes, lovely lady. Together, Isn't it interesting, you know, I mean, it's, that's the joy of comparing a show such as this. You go from one lady who will sing anything, any time, <laughs> at the drop of anything, to another lady who has to think about it. <laughs> but I think Catherine Grayson, let's be um, honest, has had a bit more singing experience. Did you, did you hear Catherine sing the yes, other day? Yes, I did. It was lovely. Uh, yeah, well, she is a Hollywood legend, isn't she? Well, I mean, she is, and yeah. she has been singing a long time, so... But she's a very together lady. Lovely. lovely. If you've just tuned in, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, Maria Venuti and Joe Perrette have announced their engagement, which we're celebrating oh, here on the show. After this he break, Don Gavin is going to join us. Wow. We'll see you then. Wow.